Well, hello everybody in the future and today and trying to think about the future of artificial intelligence. Um, actually, a lot has changed uh, very recently uh, in the last few years. I think uh, very few people anticipated uh, any of these changes um, and some of this uh, might be kind of shocking, uh, hopefully. Uh, it will all be helpful uh, to everybody um, in this discussion. So basically, I have this uh, presentation that I've been working on. It's uh, far from complete, um, and I don't think it's ever really fully going to be complete. But uh, I wanted to do a kind of a live discussion on the future of AI and artificial intelligence and really look at the next uh, five to 10 years and try to look at the next 100 years if possible, um, as ridiculous as that may seem, um, to try to look that far ahead. But, um, you know, I do have a little bit of a question for you. Um, and that is, um, do you think uh, that, uh, you know, my, my personal feeling is that uh, it's very likely that every aspect of our lives will be changed by um, AI. Um, and the question is, um, well, when and how and what are these changes um, that we might expect um, really soon? Uh, so what I want to do is start by a couple quick questions. Um, so uh, would you like to live forever? Um, and is there any problems uh, with an infinite life? Um, and what is our Earth's uh, real future um, with AI? Um, whether you're a spiritual person or not, um, or whether you're uh, totally logical, or uh, however you may think about this, um, it's important to think about because it probably, um, what we're trying to see here is we're actually seeing a lot of combination of ideas um, that are pretty far out. Um, that a lot of people uh, have been working on not only for the last, uh, you know, 10, 20 years, but really thousands of years, um, both spiritually, ethically, logically. Um, in so many ways, uh, people have been thinking about the afterlife uh, for thousands of years. So uh, a lot of these questions about uh, what the practicalities of the next life um, might be um, have been thought about by a lot of people. So, and I certainly hope uh, that you take it as a serious question, um, but um, also looking at the question of what the problems might be um, if our lives are extended. Um, certainly, um, as I get older, I start to feel the stress of my own body, um, just things breaking down, you know, pains on the right side of my head, um, and different uh, stresses. So, uh, certainly, that is a big factor, and I don't think I'm going to get through this entire presentation, essentially because there's so much to talk about. Uh, so it's really difficult to understand um, everything on our planet. Um, one thing that I would definitely recommend is uh, rethinking about everything and kind of thinking about it with a pretty open mind, um, because a lot... Uh, has already changed. There's some uh, so many things. Uh, you can hear the police uh, in the background right now. Um, there's just a lot of stuff that's really been surprising, um, and I'm sure you can think of you know uh, many many different surprising things that have happened um, in your lifetime and really in everybody's lifetime uh, all throughout these uh, many centuries. Um, but uh, this is kind of a map of what the Earth looks like now um, at night. Um, I think I have it as my background saver here. Um, and I can see, uh, let me just delete a couple of, oh, geez, don't want to delete, that's the actual uh, video here. But basically you can see North America, uh, here Europe, uh, the Middle East, India, China, uh, kind of Southeast Asia. Down here, uh, the light situation for Australia, Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. And then even on the North Pole, you can see up here um, in Alaska, and there is actually some light uh, down here, very small lights. Um, on the peninsula, kind of, of Antarctica. So one way to think about this is that uh, right now, today, a lot of the work is being done in the United States. 
uh, and essentially in the English language, but that's not totally true. Um, actually, China is building a lot of the hardware uh, now, and even India is doing a lot of IT work. Africa is doing a lot, um, and Latin America, and of course Europe. So really, all over the world, uh, there's examples. You know, even in Russia, of them trying to build their own microprocessors. Um, and really, there's been so many different projects over the years, um, whether it's trying to build uh, custom processors or custom GPUs, or really whatever you can possibly imagine um, people trying to do technologically. Um, and I was even looking at cryogenics the other day, basically the ability to freeze your body and bring it back to life. Um, and essentially what they're doing is they sell you a kind of an insur a life insurance policy. They put it, the money into the stock market and then they use that $200,000 or they can get it down to uh, you know tens of thousands of dollars. So they might do tens of thousands of dollars, freeze it, and then whatever returns they get on the investment, they use that to buy the liquid nitrogen uh, to basically keep you in what's called suspended animation. Um, but... Um, I was really surprised just in, I was driving in, in Seattle and there was a cryogenics company um, just on the side of the street. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of uh, stuff being going on um, with freezing. Uh, if you think about it, our food often is frozen, um, air conditioners and different things like that. But that's not the main topic of this. This is really about artificial intelligence and what's happening all over the world. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple details um, so most of the software is designed basically in California uh, and also in Asia, um, but basically the West Coast um, is doing a lot of that. There was kind of an IBM early days uh, on the East Coast, uh, but really Silicon Valley and California changed a lot of that. But it's likely that maybe in the future, um, although we do think of the West Coast as kind of a strong point, um, really there's a lot more technology with the lighting uh, here on the East Coast, and it's likely that some of that would probably change in the future. Um, and especially the growth, we're probably gonna see a lot of growth um, in Africa and in Latin America in the future. So what we see now um, gives us some hints as to uh, what we might see in the near future. So I wanna jump into some really kind of extreme topics. Uh, going back to this concept of living forever um, and thinking about the spirituality of both uh, science and technology and kind of the logic behind that. Um, I'm going to kind of skip, actually, some of this and maybe come back to it later. Uh, but I want to talk about this concept uh, called transhumanism and kind of universal spirituality and looking at um, kind of the next 100 years um, and maybe even further out than that. Um, but uh, a lot of people have been working on virtual reality, augmented reality, and then they have an even X, X, XR, which is cross reality. Um, but some of the concepts you might be uh, need to be familiar with is this concept of whole brain emulation. So um, you probably have heard of an MRI. Um, they can basically scan your brain in now at this point in human history um, and uh, get a pretty accurate, um, they can even implant um, uh, special fluids in your body and make it even more visible depending on how much uh, you're willing to spend on taking your MRI. I've actually been very fortunate enough to get an MRI and I'm very interested in what that might mean in the next, you know, even 10 years, 100 years, uh, bringing that uh, image back to life and maybe even me back to life uh, someday. So, uh, and basically uh, what this all comes down to is a concept of consciousness transfer, right? And basically thinking about how to transfer human consciousness um, into virtual environments um, and kind of uh, enabling our existence beyond the physical body. So that kind of gets into this concept of spirituality, right? Because transhumanism, whether you're uh, in support of transhumanism or spirituality, they kind of start to get very complex and blended together in some senses um, in terms of how we look at both 
uh, our future as humans and how we might uh, change, whether you call it evolve or whatever, um, basically things are probably going to change quite a lot. So what happened to me personally is that I kind of woke up one day and just realized, hey, not only am I getting older, um, but a lot of things are starting to change uh, with AI right now, particularly with generative AI. Um, and I think it's such a hot topic um, that uh, we just didn't anticipate it. And I think there's going to be other key terms uh, like generative AI. Um, if you haven't heard of transhumanism, this is definitely time to start thinking about that. Um, and this context of unified consciousness or cosmic consciousness. Um, and basically that's really exploring the idea of really advanced technologies uh, that can help us achieve a higher state of consciousness. So I think a lot of people in the spiritual world have been thinking about different states of consciousness, um, whether you're alive or dead or bringing you back to life. Um, there's been all kinds of stories you've probably heard about people dying and then coming back to life. Um, and what those technologies might mean uh, to the future of everything here on the planet. Um, and I want to be careful because I've been studying Africa and Latin America, and particularly the, the Congo jungle, places like Rwanda, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and Brazil, and the deep in the Amazon, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, the Caribbean, and then not even to mention uh, places like uh, Southeast Asia, Oceania, and places like that. So there's just totally different perspectives all around the world, uh, as you will discover. And like I said, I definitely recommend taking a few months or even years, as I spent years trying to study the whole entire planet, um, getting a perspective of the geology and basically the facts uh, about how our planet really works um, has really helped me out a lot. Uh, it's had, it makes it really easy to have a conversation with people around the world, um, whether they're in Asia, Europe, Africa, Latin America, I know quite a bit now about all kinds of places around the world. So basically what we're talking about here is redefining humanity um, and what that might mean um, and kind of looking at a place called post-humanism, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of people have said, uh, you know, talked about heaven and hell and if you read, certain people have talked about thousands of years of hell. Uh, and that may be a real reality. Um, if we start to live for long periods of time, we could have some very dangerous things. So it's not always just so easy saying, hey, let's live forever. That's going to be great. As I get older, things are not always necessarily great. Um, so that's something to think about is our biological limitations, but also how we can transcend those biological limitations and start to address some of these questions of our personal identity. So one of the questions here in transhumanism is who are we, right? If, you know, there is questions about as we change, you know, if we're talking about cyborgs or different kinds of people or just our evolution or or change in who we are, that identity can change. So basically what that means is that um, you know, there are people already working on implanting chips uh, into the brain. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of uh, neuroscience and surgeries going on, uh, working on how to uh, study the brain. Um, but that really comes down to consciousness transfer as well as our personal identity. So who we are can kind of morph um, and that can change quite a bit. Um, so uh basically uh there's a question between digital immortality um physical immortality and transferring our human consciousness between those states and what it means to be alive uh and basically a lot of this might even come into topics like uh neural spiritual technologies um which is an interesting topic because Basically, as we have kind of a reality that is more spiritual um, and not so much just practical uh, neurons uh, as we know them today, uh, some of that uh, these neural spiritual technologies may become very important, enabling kind of deeper connections not only with ourselves and other people, but the entire universe, right? So that is a really important concept that really kind of made me really excited about the future because I was like, wow. 
Um, if we can change who we are um, and we can even get involved with the fabric of the universe, that could be really awesome. Um, I played a game called Second Life. I don't know if you've heard of this game. A friend of mine uh, got me into it. It's kind of old school game now, but you can actually uh, create an avatar, be a real person, and kind of talk in a virtual world that creates a virtual reality and kind of augmented reality. Um, so next, I want to kind of look at this picture on BBC that I got here. Um, what if the brain could be split into two different halves? And it actually is two different halves. But what if they actually started to think differently and things like that? It's a very interesting topic. So really what we need to do is rethink death, right? And rethink our human morphological freedom. Do all plants lead to God? Um, this is a kind of interesting question. I heard it on a video the other day. Someone was saying, well, yeah, pretty much every path is going to lead to the universe. Every path is going to, we're going to learn something from every path. But there are definitely some dangerous ideas out there that we need to consider. And um, certainly there's a different question for animals. And actually there's also kind of, uh, ideas around the world. So whether or not uh, you are a Westerner or an Easterner, there's different consciousnesses and different ideas uh, that different people are definitely working on, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam. A lot of these different ideas uh, are starting to make uh, more sense uh, to a lot of different people. So um, one thing I'd mention here, this is kind of a scary concept, is that we are already in a very kind of questionable state, right? So the average person spends about seven hours a day on the internet. Right now you're on the internet, for instance. I don't know how long you've been on the internet, but I've been recording this for at least 15 minutes. So um, anyway, so basically the point is, is that if you take this and you take 24 hours minus seven, and you have eight hours for sleep minus eight, and then you work eight hours, that only leaves one hour left. What are you gonna do with that hour? Maybe eat and that's about it. So we're already at a huge turning point in the history. We basically spent seven hours a day on the internet. That's the truth. And that's kind of ridiculous. Um, we need to really rethink about that. We need to think about how we can watch out for that because that's almost becoming hell in some senses, um, just sitting on the internet all day. It's not very healthy. So here's some of the most important technology cities on the planet. Um, I just kind of kept track of them. Most people agree that most of the startups, there's about a thousand or so uh, working on AI right now. Um, in San Francisco, right here, number two slot, you can see New York City. Um, and then you see Beijing, China actually is number three. Um, and then you see this Silicon Roundabout, it's called Silicon Roundabout, kind of funny name in the UK, and then Shanghai being a number five here, and then Bangalore, India. And then you see Tokyo, and then Shenzhen, which is right across from Hong Kong. And then Seattle uh, being high here. Uh, a lot of people aren't really familiar with this, but Tel Aviv, uh, Israel is very uh, important. A lot of major uh, processors have been designed there and different hardware and software projects have been run. Seoul, Korea, Toronto is actually another hit city. A lot of people aren't very familiar with uh, outside the United States. A lot of people aren't familiar with Austin, but they call it Silicon Hills. And then there's Boston with Kendall Square, Paris, Berlin, Singapore, Hong Kong, Stockholm, Los Angeles. Just a ton of different cities here that you can look at um, that all have thousands and thousands of startups working on AI. The other really important question is this concept of virtual idols. Um, so a lot of people ask this question about God, the internet, what's going on. Um, so global virtual idol market is now valued at 1 billion US dollars and is projected to reach 8.2 billion. That's a lot of money. Um, 8.2 billion dollars is a dollar for almost every person on the planet is spending. And actually a dollar on the internet is quite a lot of money because uh, the amount of electricity that one dollar can buy is quite amazing. So YouTube, according to YouTube watch time, one billion hours of videos on the platform every day. That means there's at least a billion people watching one hour of YouTube 
and it's probably even more than that. So when you consider the entire internet. Now, there's certain these virtual idols. I don't know if you've heard of them. I started to do some research on them. Uh, it's quite uh, becoming a uh, kind of interesting concept because we are creating a lot of these avatars now and virtual uh, environments. Uh, it's something to definitely think about and put on the radar. Someone asked you a question. Is everything going to be influenced by AI? Um, and what do you think about this? Um, what is the future really going to be like? I mean, are we still going to have um, some old school things? Um, well, I think the truth is, is that there's going to be a little bit of both. Uh, there's definitely going to be um, a major change that already has been. So when you look at the numbers, the average person on the planet is already spending about seven hours essentially there's only one hour of the day left over to eat so that's changing just about everything and one thing we can see is that there has been very significant progress in ai over the past few years um, the concept of complex deep machine learning generative ai models <laughs> generative ai models i should have said um, and basically the optimization of everything in our lives towards the computer and we even had robotic surgery and just so many different aspects. One thing that I didn't really talk about too much in this thing is government AI and military AI. Um, it certainly is a very big topic that we should consider and discuss. Um, and I think for some reason it didn't show the picture here. Not sure why. Um, but uh, basically there's all kinds of questions in drone warfare right now, kind of like looking at how robotics might change the future of war. That's kind of a scary concept. Um, and definitely should be discussed and looked at very carefully. Here's kind of a picture right from right already today. You can see this is in Singapore. They have an actual police just cruising the airport with two police guards. And I don't know what's going on. I've seen guns on these things. I've seen spray containers. They could do all kinds of crazy stuff um, with these little robots uh, cruising around. And what if there's a glitch on the computer system? Who knows um, if how bad that could get. Um, here's another picture of how big these, this is a picture of a person right here. When I first started seeing these robots in Asia, they have ginormous, this is just one of the pictures. I wish I got uh, many different pictures um, for this. Um, and then a lot of people are using these um, DJI is becoming a huge company in China. They do uh, drones. For some reason, it didn't show the picture here. Not sure why. Um, but, uh, and then there's an expression called explainable AI, um, and how we can basically start to understand things, uh, should we, how, how do we go about understanding what's going on in the details of the AI systems? This is a topic that's super important, um, definitely, um, that you should study if you're looking into the details. It's called meta learning and transfer learning. So basically what happens is that you have an AI model, that AI model is starting to learn and work with other AI models, so you basically have two different models that are transferring and learning from each other, and that becomes a very complex topic uh, to understand. And then one thing to think about is the future of how we spend our money um, with AI, right? Uh, it's likely the cost of food will keep going up for humans um, because we still simply have less and less space on the planet. There's really not a whole lot of farmland left uh, for us to have. Um, however, in other areas, the prices may go down, like entertainment. Um, actually, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to have fun. Um, oftentimes, most of the websites that we go to online uh, are free or very low cost. Sorry, I had to get some water there. But um, basically, you can see the transportation and housing. What I'm basically detecting is that there's certain things that are becoming shareable. So a lot of the resources on our planet, we simply cannot keep doing all the trash and the waste that we do on the planet. We're going to have to start sharing our cars and we're going to have to start sharing our houses more. Um, and so these two costs really are a big part of the future. Uh, what we see is Airbnb and we already see self-driving cars and taxis and a lot of things like that. Um, that could really radically change everything. And there's some weird costs like insurance, and there's even this thing called brain-computer interfaces, which I wanted to talk about. So we do see a lot of proof that everything keeps getting better and better. And in fact, we keep seeing that computers keep getting faster and faster over the years, for sure. So here's another really cool map called Open Infrastructure Map, kind of showing all the electrical lines 
Um, we're for sure going to see a lot of changes in Africa. We already see a lot of changes in South America and actually even Australia as well. And as we start to talk about nuclear power, here's all the nuclear reactors on the planet. There's definitely going to be some major changes um, in outer space and how we look at even smaller mini nuclear reactors. So this last section is just looking at all the companies right here on the planet right now around the world. Um, you can see Asia technology companies I kind of highlighted a lot of them there. This is all by the uh, acreage that they take up. So I haven't really done it based on the money that they're making the physical size of where they work. Um, you can see Huawei, Tencent, um, and different places. Here's property size. Um, you can see uh, Stanford, uh, California, um, Berkeley, NASA, Apple, Tesla, a lot of these places having quite a lot of property. Um, and then even in Taiwan, um, Taiwan is super important. And you can see here Europe um, and then Latin America, uh, different companies as well. And then just looking at the overall population of our planet um, as we start to take more and more land away. Um, certainly some stuff to think about. Anyway, let me know what you think about the future of AI and artificial intelligence. I would say uh, I asked the AI what I should really think about a lot, and that was brain-computer interfaces. It really thought that that would be an area... Uh, that is super important to look at uh, very carefully um, as well as so many other aspects but i really hope you enjoyed the presentation let me know what you think about all these ideas i really want to try to work on some of these projects i'd be glad to try to work with you on any aspect of the future of ai and trying to live out into further out into the future thank you so much